My name is Reggie Caudell. I'm the interim dean for the School of uh, Management. And it's my pleasure to welcome you here for this evening's session. I saw many of you at, uh, at noontime. You looked a lot more refreshed at noon than you do right now, let me tell you that. No, I know it's been an exciting afternoon. Uh, and uh, the opportunity to, to bring together things that you've learned throughout your career here at NJIT and put it together in a capstone so that you're dealing with so many issues and using techniques that you learned in different classes. And, and uh, it's uh, always a, a really important aspect to be able to pull things together and, to, and also work in teams. Um, but it's also important to have guidance and mentorship with you. And that's really one of the other aspects of uh, this event today, is being able to uh, be able to, to, to learn and to share and to uh, succeed. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we would like to do is we have a, a couple of speakers uh, uh, before the teams will make their presentations. And so I would uh, like to introduce our first speaker, Ray Cassetta. Uh, Ray is uh, the chair of the School of Management's Industrial Advisory Board, uh, and he's been very active as a graduate of NJIT, and it's just a pleasure to have Ray this evening to, to give you a little bit of a few words of, of introduction. Uh, but it's uh, always great to have Ray here. So let's, uh, let's bring Ray up, if you would. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and congratulations on being here. You are the chosen groups who have done the best so far in Mike's Bikes. And that's quite an honor to be here. Uh, on and off over the last 12 or so years, I've occasionally come in as an outside judge to judge the uh, end of the year presentations of the uh, classes in Mike's Bikes. And it's an accomplishment. And to be selected to come here tonight, now that this has evolved into a capstone course, is quite a privilege. And you should all be very proud of yourselves for being here tonight. Uh, our program, after I'm finished, is going to uh, include a keynote speaker. Then the teams will be introduced. Each of the seven teams will be introduced. You will make your presentations. There will be a tabulation of the scores. And we'll have a winner and a loser. And no matter which end of that scale you're on, be proud of the fact that you're here and learn from it. I was speaking to a couple of the professors this afternoon about the learning opportunity in both success and temporary failure in Mike's Bikes. All of you, whether you're on the first team or the last team, should look at what the others did and learn from it. Uh, the awards will be presented, and that will be the end of the evening. So with that, I'm going to introduce our keynote speaker, also an NGAIT graduate. I came out of the uh, industrial engineering department back in the days when we didn't have computers and simulations like Mike Bikes. We walked around with slide rules in, in my era here. But our speaker tonight is, an, is a graduate of the Executive MBA program, Amir Alfar. He's currently the Corporate Chief Information Officer for Omnicon Group. He's had several previous positions, nice ones. Senior Vice President for Information Technology at Med Medvante and Vice President for Network Services at IDT Corporation. In addition, he has a, a lot of experience with network management, monitoring systems tools, 
and operations centers build out. Amir has managed corporate-wide infrastructure standards, delivering improved service levels, and he's also established and mentored global teams in fast growth environments. With that, I will introduce Mike. He, as I said, he's Amir, he's a graduate. He's got a family, two proud daughters. Step up. They warned me that uh, it's a little unstable, so they didn't want to put you to the same, uh, same experience. It's okay, but it's okay with me. <laughs> um, so thank you for having me. Um, I uh, definitely appreciate the opportunity to come and, and speak with uh, uh, the, the brightest within the business administration group. Uh, I wish I was part of the mentor groups that was here, but uh, uh, I couldn't have been here earlier, so, but I heard it was actually very involved, and I gotta say that the Capstone project was probably my favorite uh, thing within the EMBA program as well, and uh, it's just very engaging, and you know, to see you guys has worked as hard as you were able to work in, in just one day, uh, it's very impressive, so um, definitely congratulations on your hard, on your hard work. Um, one of the things, or, or the thing that I wanna talk about is, um, how do you prepare yourself, uh, or how does a, a, a degree in NGIT prepare you for a lifetime of learning? And I just wanted to talk about really two topics that are related. Uh, one of them is probably a bit personal, and one um, is more uh, of uh, a standard one that you probably would have may he heard about or may not, but I think it should be interesting. Uh, just to give a quick background of um, you know what I've done or where I came from, um, I came to the States about in 1990, I was 18 years old, um, had $100 in my pocket and my brother's phone number. And <laughs> that was the, the, the charter. Um, I actually applied first to NGIT and I was accepted. Unfortunately, they didn't accept all my credits. And Jersey City State was a little bit more accommodating and was allowing me to uh, finish earlier. So that's where I got my undergrad degree. But uh, my older brother graduated from NGIT and a master degree in, in um, civil engineering. The first school I've ever visited in America was NGIT. Uh, this was 1990 sometime. So I have a you know, great admiration to uh, the school and what it stands for and the amazing growth that the school has been going through over the years. Uh, and again, it's a privilege and honor to, to be here. Uh, so again, graduated from Jersey City State with a computer science degree and a physics minor. Uh, from there, I went to work in J&J &J for a year as an intern. Uh, if you're ever, ever able to get an internship, in, to be in part of the internship program or a co-op program, please do it regardless of the pay or the position. Um, it's an amazing opportunity to be able to, and that's actually a great thing that NGIT has, and they really work very hard to try to set you up with uh, co-op opportunities. So J&J &J was a great opportunity for a year there. Uh, then worked through the merger of Bell Atlantic and Linux Mobile. Long time ago, this was before Verizon Wireless came to be. Um, and then I was blessed to have worked in IDT, which was um, a couple of blocks from here. I think the building still stands, even though the company may have shrunk a bit. Uh, but uh, I was there for about 10, 11 years. And uh, it offered me a great opportunity to actually come to the school that I always wanted to be part of and uh, take to be part of the MBA program. Uh, that being said, um, during that time, it was about 90, um, sorry, 2007, if you remember, there was, so I was there during the dot-com bubble, the bust, and beyond, I always say. And then eventually the new, um, the new uh, sort of recession that started in 2007 uh, with the financial meltdown. At that time, I was in my MBA um, program here, and I was looking for other opportunities. And I started an, another job in a smaller company, a startup called Medavante, uh, what I used to call it at the time down south, where I actually live now. <laughs> it's by Princeton, New Jersey. And um, everybody explained to me that it was not south, it's just central Jersey. And now I say that to most people that live where I used to live in North Jersey, but it is far south. Um, so Medavanti was a tiny company. Uh, I went from a, managing a group of close to 150 people to be in a company of 50 people. 
um, and have a couple of people working for you. Went from having admin and marketing group, facilities team, and all finance team to be a, you know, an entrepreneur in some sense. Um, I have to say, though, I couldn't have been ever able to survive in a job like I had in Miravante without having gone through the MBA program. Um, to give a little bit more color to it, working in a company like IDT where it was technology centric, you really had to speak tech. And if you didn't speak tech, you were not respected. And the CEO would speak tech back to you. And everyone speaks the same language and that was the norm. To go a small company like Miravante, it was a pharmaceutical clinical trial company, very different sphere, very different uh, environment. When you speak technology to them too much, it's taken as if you're trying to speak over their heads and you're just not clear, and you're being uh, intentionally condescending, which is totally the wrong messages you want to set up, <laughs> especially in such a small group. Everyone knows everyone. What you say to the person in the morning, everyone's going to hear about in the afternoon. So you better be on your uh, tip-top shape. Um, so again, being in a, through the MBA program uh, have definitely taught me personally, at least, a great deal of really appreciating every single thing about what makes a full company. And even if you're in a technology company, um, it's never really about you or about you by yourself. And how technology could be more of an enabler than itself being the object of everything. Um, I remember a couple of classes, like the governance class, with some of our professors that are sitting with us. And I remember um, the marketing class with Dr. Mehta and uh, the senior trip that we had. I mean, these classes have been, I never appreciated marketing as much as I've appreciated when I was with Dr. Mehta. Uh, I had, a, a, I, had the, I guess, a privilege to try to create a, a marketing plan for what I thought would be an easy topic for me, which was Dell computers. And I understood everything about Dell computers. And I couldn't, for the best of me, over two weeks, write five slides presentation about a marketing plan <laughs> for Dell computers. And thank God it was a teamwork because there was a lot of other people that bailed me out that day. Um, but again, when you go through these experiences and you sit in a meeting next time around with a person that do marketing, you don't have this um, ego about you that I'm the IT guy, I'm the one who set this whole thing up. You actually shut up and humble yourself and learn something. <laughs> um, and, and that was huge, not just in Miravanti but beyond. The company actually that I work in right now uh, is an, uh, a, a group of, um, it's a basically a holding company of advertisement and marketing and PR agency. So again, you can never tell where your career would take you. Um, and I really wanted to second the notion about uh, the, 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 you know, appreciating the others, but the continuous learning that spoke about, spoken of earlier. Um, I was actually talking about it with Elaine before coming in and she was mentioning it and it happens to be the, the, the same thing I was talking about. One thing that I realized that successful people, and I don't claim to be one, I happen to be at the right place at the right time in certain areas, and again, we're very early in our journey, all of us. Um, but successful people actually learn every day. They read every day. They write a small note every day. They set a time for learning every day. Um, growing up in Egypt, I always at least was taught to study hard so therefore when you graduate you never have to worry about it. That was a fallacy. <laughs> um, because you study hard so you would love studying and you would love learning and you actually enjoy learning for the rest of your life. And if you don't, you're gonna have a problem. <laughs> you know, there is such a thing as a, it, it, it could get harder as you get older because things get more sophisticated, especially if you're not in touch with school. One of the best things one can do is be close to his school. Uh, I mean, having the opportunity to debate with your professors and, uh, and, and talk out loud and think out loud is something that you will have the opportunity for in school, but if you master it, it can help you for a lifetime. Um, I did want to show at least a small clip about um, one of my favorite uh, technologists, um, and I'm sure most of folks, I, it was a longer video, so I only uh, I, I think it would be appropriate to just maybe watch two minutes of it, uh, which is another Dr. Meta tip, by the way, whenever the students fall asleep from him. We used to have a whole day class from 8 in the morning until 5 p.m. So he had at least 15 clips that he would wake us up with in the middle of every class. 
Um, so if you get nothing from whatever I said, I think learning it from Steve Jobs would be a whole lot better anyway. But uh, just to give you a little bit of perspective and color of what we're talking about, um, this is when Steve Jobs is an amazing personality. I mean, if you ever thought, um, again, which was one of my misconceptions as well, that failure is not an option, uh, it's a mistake. You, you know, failure is just a road for new learning and for new opportunities of growth. And there is no one that exemplifies this more than Steve Jobs. Uh, here's a guy that created a company that was worth more, worth in the billions before he was in his mid-20s, then gets fired from his own company that he created by the person that he brought in. <laughs> and not only gets fired, gets fired and basically, in some sense, humiliated in the process and starts a new startup, this company called Next, if you ever heard of it. Uh, this was basically one of their earliest, um, and you can you, t you know, Google it in, in YouTube. Um, this is one of their first offsites, where he basically brought the small number of engineers that he trusts and works closely with in an offsite to talk about his vision. So Next again was a, a revolutionary computer that was supposed to be sold to students. Um, it was, he's going to talk about it a little bit, but the price tag could not exceed $3,000. It had a lot of advancements that did not exist at the time in computers. This is 1987, just to put things in perspective. And unfortunately for Steve Jobs, that company also failed. <laughs> so, and he put, his own, put a lot of his own personal money in it. But I, I want to just leave it at that and then come back and tell you how exactly that failed. What may have been perceived as a failure was actually one of his best, most amazing successes. Just the, 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 so the company actually, again, the, the concept of the company didn't quite work. However, the interesting thing is, during the middle of 1990s, Apple was having a lot of problems themselves. They couldn't get out um, the new operating system for Macintosh um, to work effectively, and it was basically having its own set of problems. Um, so Apple computers, it, in 1996, bought Next, and because its own efforts to, to upgrade the Macintosh have failed, after the sale, Steve Jobs became first an advisor and later appointed as acting CEO and later the CEO of, of the company. Next step, which is the operating system, is the heart of Mac OS X. So whatever work that was deemed to have been a failure, that the company that didn't work, actually became the heart of the success of Apple as we know it today. So just keep that in mind as you not only progress in your, uh, not, not just for the capstone thing for today, but in general, in life, whatever you may perceive as a failure is the best learning opportunity. Whatever people may perceive as um, you know, something bad that happened to you is really gonna be the seeds, not only for your success, your success and so many people's success. Apple is part of American um, government, not only, uh, success, but actually part of our overall success. To have a company that's worth $600 billion is an amazing success for all of us. It's part of how we are operating in everyday life. So, you know, uh, I think it was said very well, there is no, you know, winners or losers in here for specifically, today, but in general, you will learn your best lessons from those things that may be the hardest for you. And, um, you know, keep on learning. This is the best place to be. Thanks. Thank you, Amir. And now Professor Gopalakrishnan is going to introduce the teams. I'd like to thank you all for being here. Um, the four, class of 492, all the seniors that are here, and particularly thank the seven teams that participated. All of you did a fabulous job, and like our keynote speaker said, there are no winners and losers. It's the taking part that counts. So you are all winners because you were the best of the best. 19 teams competed in the class, and the top seven really came on to compete today. So we can't all have winners, but you all have done a fabulous job. So you should all congratulate yourselves on a job 
very, very well done. I particularly want to thank our mentors. They've taken a lot of their time and I think they've worked hard with their teams. And so I'm very quickly going to acknowledge them by name. Letty Fabiano uh, worked with one of the teams, Brandon Rockwell, Kelly O'Connor, Michelle Scott, Jim Schworn, Justin Cleland, and Brett Johnson. Please give them a big hand. And I'd also like to thank Marguerite Schneider, who worked very hard with me in putting this thing together and having the game go on today. So the way we're gonna present is each team is gonna have seven minutes to present and three minutes for question and answers. We'll leave the, uh, the mentors are going to judge the teams and they will get the first shot at asking questions and then we'll throw the question open to the floor if they don't have more than one or two questions. So we will start with the team that placed seventh, which is Mia's around, and the team consists of Anjali Harris, Yvette Varga, and Myra Mangal. Don't move too much. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Well, let's see if I can, if I can get this open. Um, here we go. There I go. Okay. All right. Hello. Um, hi, everybody. My name is uh, Yvette Vargas, um, and these are my group partners, Anjali Harris and Myra Mangolia, sorry. <laughs> um, and we are Mia Rounds. So, so we wanted to tell you a little bit about Mia Rounds. Um, uh, Anjali um, was the CEO, so she navigated through for us to um, to how we wanted to monitor things and and uh, assigned uh, information to us to look up and address. Um, I was the, um, C, um, the CSO, so I did the strategic management, um, and I uh, looked into different forms of strategizing for the market and, um, and, and looked into research for that. Um, here's our CS, CFO, and she did um, all the number crunching. She made sure that everything was clear and worked well. So um, as our mission statement says, um, we want to produce elegant um, products that are made from high quality material and give you a high quality product. Um, so this is just a look at our executive summary. We could kind of just flash through that. We are, um, consider ourselves a manufacturing brand house. We focused more on our brand. We tried to do um, a lot of differentiation methods. Um, we decided to carve out focused niches in our markets, which we're gonna go into later. And um, we decided to seek quality instead of quantity. And we will explain how we tried, we were searching for this strategy and we didn't find it. So let's get into that. Um, so our company strategy. So when we played before for the 490 class, um, we did niche differentiation where there was a total of five markets and we really only pursued four and in one particular market we had two bikes. So we decided in the competition we were going to intensify that idea. We would have three product lines and we would only have um, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, three product lines, we only have two models per line. So total, we would have six different bikes. This was the idea. And also, we thought we would seize market share through saturation. So in our three product lines, you would be hard pressed to avoid buying our bike. This is what we thought. So what exactly happened to where we did not achieve this? What happened? was that we undershot our planned capacity in the beginning. 
Um, Miss Marguerite, I'm, she tried so hard to help us, really. Um, we were a little too late in catching this. So in Mike Spikes, the rollover periods take one year. So honestly, if you don't catch yourself within one year, you can ruin everything, which is what happened to us. So it was a combination of undershooting our plan capacity at the same time as having a pricing oversight, literally human error, where I thought I input one number and that was not what was input. And um, that, what that led to was undershooting uh, product advertising. So that's what happened. We were unable to get rid of the inventory. It accumulated and accumulated and accumulated. And even when we had stopped production, we couldn't actually get rid of it. Because it is a simulation and not necessarily real world, um, there were certain things that we couldn't do, like you know, write off our inventory and such. Um, and so we were unable to catch up to market advertising expenditures. So some teams were advertising $2 million for one bike, and we had like 500,000, and that's, exactly why we couldn't get rid of the inventory, the death spiral. So that's what happened. Um, so this is a look at our income statement. This is the year that it all happened. And as you can see, that's the year where we start the death spiral. And we cannot get out of it. We do try, Miss Marguerite tries, our advisor he tries, but it doesn't really work. Um, this is just a look at our marketing expenditure. Uh, our CFO is gonna take us through our ratios. Marketing expenditures, as we could see, um, we did not spend uh, as much as we wanted to at the beginning, and that was kind of like the strategy where it went wrong, and then towards the end of the years, we tried to get a catch up, but it was too late already. Then we have our ratios. Um, are, we, are we, oh, I'm sorry, this is the leverage ratios. Okay, so like you see, our debt was really high, and then it was just, we just didn't have the money to catch up and be able to pay off our debts. Um, then we have our ROE, ROS, and ROA, and you know, the first three years we were doing really well, and then 2017, that's when everything really went downhill and we hit the negative numbers. And of course, I don't think any company would like to invest in us, but we were more than happy, take your money. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, our future planning. We will plan to sell inventory, plant, and most likely go bankruptcy. Um, we'll try to get uh, injection cash, but didn't work either. But we'll we'll very happy playing the game and the experience that we obtained. It was really we learned a lot. Learned a lot. <laughs> and we didn't actually get that injection because there was another company that did so. It didn't help us that we weren't able to get that help because when we when we made our error, it was just midway in the game. So any questions? We'll take them. Any yeah. questions? I think we were pretty thorough. Yep. <laughs> Go ahead. Thank you very much. Do you have a question? Oh, yes. So your strategy was one that focuses on cash. At any point during that, you know, crisis horizon, were you um, at odds with, you know, were you always in agreement with the strategy and how you started off? Or we were in agreement with the idea of the strategy. How to go about it, um, we kind of, I, I don't think we necessarily, uh, agreed on it because we had different ideas of how much we should put in. So one was being, one of us were being conservative, the other one was being much more aggressive. So we kind of just like blindly picked it and I think that was part of our issue. Literally, it goes medium, and then I'm really conservative, and she's our radical person. So the ideas that she has usually would take us one way or the other, and I would try to see if maybe, oh, let's not do that, let's not do this. And so really what you get, or what we have, what happened was a combination of the three. So there were some radical ideas in the midst of some conservative ideas, and perhaps if we had just stuck to one way or the other, maybe that would have helped, or maybe it would have tanked even worse, even sooner. So we can't say for sure. Any more? Sure, yes. I'll take that. 
Definitely, I would increase the capacity. That was the first thing we should have done from the beginning, the first year. Um, because we, if you look at all our specs, and you know, we spend a lot of money on branding, so we had the name, we had the product, the product was there. And but was we the just, quality. and the quality was there. Our quality was above average compared to all the teams. I think we did good there. But we just did not have the, um, the correct price, and we didn't have the capacity for the demand. And inventory, once that inventory started accumulating, it was just nowhere to go. It's just, we couldn't get a reverse. So I think inventory had a lot to do with it. I would say also, I would have dumped more money into the product advertisement, because I, I, I felt that we were too conservative. We only put in two million, mm -hmm. and I wanted to put in more, but they didn't want to go into debt immediately. And again, I, I would have pushed being more radical in the beginning, versus we were radical towards the end, because everyone's like, well, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> Any more? Yes. So uh, what was your profit from this? Profit? Uh-huh. Oh, we, we were in negative. the beginning. Oh, yes. Um, we had, in the beginning, of course, the ADV3. Ours was the bike. It was our most profitable bike. And then there was a brief moment in time where we had one leisure bike that was our most profitable bike. It didn't even last long enough for it to really be called a profit driver because literally five periods, condensed time, and it took all our money, that inventory literally sapped all our money. Chris, I saw you had 80% of your sales was uh, invested in the advertising campaign. Yeah. So, uh, oh, thank you. Huh, thank you. Let me get this out of here. I took this out. I hope that's okay. Thank you, Mia's Round. Uh, our next team is Spinwheel, and the team Spinwheel team consists of three women again Jessica De Silva, Helen Llewellyn, and um, Allison Roberts. Hi everyone, um, good evening, we're Spin Wheel. My name is Allison, this is Helen, and this is Jessica. And um, this is our mission statement where we just basically wanted to let people know that we the best, the best part of the destination, um, the, the riding is uh, <laughs> the best part the best of life. life. It's <laughs> not the destination, it's the ride. And our motto was to give you the best wheels for your ride. Uh, our planning and we doing had a big plan. <laughs> we had a big plan. Okay, let me, let me take over. Yes. We, <laughs> all right. Uh, we had our plan was to go big or go home. That was our intention. Based on how we played and how we observed the other teams, we thought starting out, we're going to make a big bold move, develop three bikes, whereas in the game. We were number one throughout the game uh, in our world, at, in the class, and we said, okay, the team that won big did bold moves. So we took that as a cue. However, all good plans. <laughs> we realized that we missed on the pricing. And we purposely over 
shot the design specs because normally we would go right on target, but we picked up that if we, uh, because the design moves as the game goes on, we thought if we made it a little bit better than the spec, that it will be a well sort of sort after bike. Our mission, our goal strategy throughout the game was we intended to be middle of the road, good price, and brand ourselves as a reliable company in all the markets. Unfortunately, when we went to pricing, we did not pay attention to the fact that we were creating a quality product, but we were selling it at a lower price. And that, in the end, shot us in the foot. We could not recover from that once we launched. Um, well, we did recover. We did recover. We did recover. Correction. <laughs> we, we did recover. Um, our objective was to, be, to play the game, was to basically increase sales, increase market share, uh, increase the awareness. Our awareness was good, um, but our market share was not. Unfortunately, we, we, we lost um, a lot of market shares. We were on the verge of getting bankrupt. We were inject, we had cash infusion, and we played, I, I believe we played a great game because we were able to come back out of where we were with what they gave us, we were able to pay off the debt from what they gave us. And you know, it might not have been where we wanted to go, but we were able to pay off whatever we had, what we, what we, what we borrowed. And we learned, uh, from, our we learned from our mistakes. Okay. So it's... Our shareholder was not, uh, value was not optimum, but I think that the direction that we were going, had we had more time, we would have definitely been a contender. Uh, we cut our losses, because you, as you know in business, uh, cut your losses, move on. And that's exactly what we did. And we do appreciate, although it would have been better to be a winner, we do appreciate the learning experience that we gained. Um, what's the next one? And the, the big thing is we did not go bankrupt, which was a major, <laughs> major. <laughs> It, we really fought bankrupt. for not going bankrupt. <laughs> Even though we didn't have the share or the value that we wanted, we still feel that we're accomplished something of not going bankrupt based on where we were. Yes. Okay, yes. okay. Uh, so, um, you know, Let's looking back on minutes. it, okay, looking back on it, uh, we didn't Let's capitalize on our sales, which was a big hit for us in the beginning years. Uh, we spent too much on marketing and advertising early on, uh, hoping it would make a, a bigger impact. It ended up costing us more. Uh, we began making attempts to recover uh, two years into the game. Like they said, we had a cash infusion. We managed to pay back that um, debt that was given to us, and then our goal at that point was just to keep the company afloat and to um, try and begin selling off and reducing everything so that we could have some kind of cash and some kind of market value when we ended the game, which we did. Uh, not where we wanted to be, but we did. And that's it. Any questions? No questions? No yeah. questions? There's one right here. Oh, yes. Oh. Once, once we realized what the problem was, we definitely, there's not a problem with our specs, um, or our manufacturing. Our manufacturing. We're actually, um, throughout the game, we're, we're very uh, efficient in our manufacturing. Uh, so in terms of innovation, is that, in terms of innovation, probably uh, changing the way we market it. In, 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 in terms of uh, not, confusing the customer. Um, uh, not confusing the customer, which is what we did. Uh, because of the pricing glitch, we had the adventure which was being sold at a mid-range, and then we went really low on the other two bikes that we introduced into the, into the market. And that changed the way our branding was. Um, so the, it's like going in, as someone told us, it's like going into Saks Fifth Avenue and seeing Walmart products. <laughs> We're giving it Hello, it ain't gonna work. <laughs> 
Did that answer the question? Okay. <laughs> Any other questions? No. no. Any other questions? Any other questions? No? no? Right. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. <laughs>I try to figure out how to work this. There we go. Got it. F5? Okay. Good evening, everyone. Uh, we are MACA. I am Cindy Yang, and over here we have my teammates, Matthew McCartan, Andrew Chautry, and Armando Paz. Now, our mission statement is to provide diverse and high-quality bikes without the price tag. So a little, a little blurb about us. We're founded in 2014 by the team members, and we're a bicycle company that caters to five different markets, the adventure, leisure, commuter, racer, and kids market segments. So overall profitability and competition. Uh, Maka Inc. had a struggling profit after 2018 because of the shift in market share. We, were, we didn't start off strong with, um, with grabbing market share. We had around 10%. And from then on, it became tougher and tougher to take more, to gain more market share as competition began to ramp up over the years, as you can tell from our profit line. Um, and as, Ma as Maka tried to become more aggress aggressive, profits began to, began to skew, as you can tell by 2018, when we tried to make different decisions, tried to be more aggressive in the market, and hopefully gain more market share. Oh, oh wow, sorry about that. <laughs> so for the market share, this is a graph. We are the green slice right there. We, what is this? Okay. Um, as, we, as we continued, we started to lose more market share that we finished with, I believe, 5.7% of the market share. Um, we had one of the smallest market shares, which shows that we have an opportunity for growth, for future growth in other markets if we became more innovative, if we came out with a better strategic plan. And looking back, if we had become more aggressive early on in the market, we, um, we could have done better. We could have performed better. And not having high costs in branding, advertising, and unit prices caused us to have less market share early on. As one of our um, former speakers said earlier, had they been more aggressive in the beginning, if you know, we could have gotten more done. And once you know, once you're in the middle of the competition, once you're in the middle of everything um, moving forward, it was hard to to compete against the top three at that point. Okay, so income is pretty much where we made our biggest loss. Our return on sales was just, we couldn't get it up there. Um, from the beginning, we kind of started steadily. Um, we, our shareholder value was increasing steadily. We were getting more money each year. And then one year, we, we believed that the other teams cut their prices and stole pretty much all of our market share because we were increasing, we were working in a high cost, strategy and so was everyone else in the beginning and then they cut their prices and they stole share from us and that's what really did us in and we couldn't really recover from that so our return on sales took a hit our return on equity definitely took a hit because our and it, we had all this debt and not enough money to cover it up for the future of our company we definitely would cut back on cost um, so we can take that money and reinvest it in our firm we would downsize on capacity because one of our biggest things throughout the entire game was our idle time. We realized that we had too much capacity and we weren't using all of it efficiently. Um, we would focus on strategizing to gain market share. Um, one, one way we would do that is to brand more, get our brand out there, advertise, um, and then we would start maybe a loyalty program to keep our customers there. Um, like gain data from our customers in order to figure out what exactly they're looking for in their bikes, and then we can change our bikes to match that specific data. Questions? Questions? Yes, ma'am. Okay, well then, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
The next team is Real Wheels, Inc. And the team consists of Fran Edmondson, Eugene Liswan, um, Marco, and Cahayton. How's it going guys? My name is Eugene Liswan and uh, I'm going to be talking today about real wheels. So our mission statement, our mission is to make a difference in the world of bikes and to provide a safe, fun, and unforgettable experience for everyone through our, from our customers to our employees. So the background, uh, the, the marks that we tried to capture were adventurers, kids, leisures, and racers. Um, our final shareholder value was uh, 4250 which allowed us to be in fourth place. Market share, we had 16.8%, and the leader, uh, which was Champion Wheels, had 26.1%. Uh, internal results, our capacity was 60,000. Production utilization was not where we wanted it to be, but uh, it ended with 65.95%. Uh, customer satisfaction, wholesales was 66 million. Warranty rate was 0.25%. So our strategy, we focused on the long-term goals. Um, also, we were reactionary in that we uh, kind of adjusted to what other, what other firms did, and we made adjustments to every year basis. Uh, we also had an emphasis on uh, market focus. So we initially, we started with three markets, which was adventurers, leisures, and um, racers. Once we uh, had a significant impact on those, we decided to add kids in the, uh, the final stages. High quality products, we were known for, a high, for a high quality, so we decided to invest and uh, strictly monitor the quality and the specifications and technical objectives of those products. Finally, investment in advertising. We decided to fund advertising campaigns, brand awareness, which uh, led us to do very good in the early stages, first uh, four or five years, I believe. Corporate social responsibility. We uh, increased our workforce as the game progressed, and uh, as it started to turn downhill the last two years, we were forced to, um, to get rid of some also raised wages. I think our average was about $30,000. $30, Investments in nonprofit segments for underprivileged youth campaigns, clean athletes pro campaign, which was, uh, huh? uh, which was uh, clean athletes, uh, and then safe ride campaign to wear helmets for kids. I can lead you through all these graphs and you know tell you, oh, this is our share, uh, shareholder value, this is our profits, but I would rather talk about where we made mistakes, what was our strategy, uh, how we did, uh, what we did good and what we did bad. At the beginning, like... Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yes, um, I think it was, it had to do in part with our retailer margins. Um, although we, ha we were selling a lot, uh, our retailer margins was low. Uh, I think ours was at about 45 while theirs was at about 35, so 10, 10 difference. We also put, weren't putting any money into extra support. I think they put about five million, we didn't put any, so that really hurt us. They, we were spending less on our products, but they were, and we, we increased our advertising. I think we were around two, two to three million dollars each bike, and we increased it to, I think, five million in the final year, just to see what that would do for us. We really, we didn't think that our shareholder value would drop. We thought there was no way that could happen, but it did, so it happens. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, I, I, to be honest, I think we just the last year we we didn't have enough time. We were we were we were pressed for time, so we just didn't see it. Uh, we paid it back in the first year. I think we paid back uh, 1.3 million, which was a little too much for that first year. We shouldn't have did it, and then after that we just forgot. I think that was really what happened there. Any more questions? Yes. If I could just give you a comment, I heard, correct me if I'm wrong, that you were you got green wheels again. Right? Yes. So uh, just as a lesson for everybody, including for there's an old saying on Wall Street, gold and bears they both make money, but piggies go to the slaughterhouse. Mm. So that's what happened to you. 
Thank you. <laughs> if that's all the questions, we'd like to thank our advisor, Letty. She was a big help during the competition. Now up is cyclocross, and the team consists of Harry Duharry and Michael Donahue and Alex Dorsonville. <laughs> okay, how do you do full screen? Wait, what's the problem? Just 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 start it. Okay. Yeah, but that's not up on the screen. Okay, though. I, I just <laughs> Technical difficulties. Okay. No, it's working. Oh, they need this thing, yeah. Yeah. Did did the plug come out? Okay. You can also do down there with the top one. Yeah, that one. There you go. All right. Good evening, everyone. We are Cyclocross. I'm Alex, the CMO. This is Mike, our CFO. And this is Harry, our illustrious CEO. So I'll tell you a little bit about ourselves. At Cyclocross, we're cycling enthusiasts, and our mission is to translate that passion into products that provide uh, both value and quality for our consumers. And with that in mind, I'll hand it over to our CEO who will take you through our last five years. Or, yeah, last five years. Okay, so we finished for the last year, uh, year 2020, we finished with the highest profits. We were actually struggling, and you see in the year 2018, we were struggling behind uh, teams like uh, Champion Wheels and uh, Century Cycles and uh, Real Wheels. So we were struggling, and towards the end, we, to we sort of stole uh, our little second place victory. So our market analysis, uh, we only had around 19.5 shares. We finished with a shareholder value of 92, a little bit over 92. Our initial strategy included an aggressive start by uh, entering into two, uh, in two biking markets. We had an aggressive marketing plan, uh, high advertising and uh, high PR in order to gain more shares. Uh, towards our ending strategy, we wanted to reduce our cost, and this really helped. You'll see in year 2018 that uh, we actually began to pick up. We, this was for two reasons. We reduced our costs and also released new bikes. Timing in our market was very important. So what we wanted to do while the, while the contest was coming to a close, we wanted to release new bikes that we can, have for, that we can sell for lower cost. Our new bikes, we, had very, uh, we spent a lot on R&D in order to reduce our manufacturing cost, and this really helped us. We were able to take sales away from the, higher, uh, the teams above us, the companies that were uh, dominating the market at the time, and we were able to sneak into second place. 
So this is the, our current ratio. It's pretty straightforward. Um, we've had an extremely healthy current ratio for at least the past four years, maintaining above th uh, three. But now for the, our return on assets and our return on equity is really what shines is that for our return on assets alone aver for the last four years, average close to 45, 50%. And really, one of our major things that we were able to accomplish was managing our inventories towards the end because that's where we did start to hurt because that's when we really noticed that we would have left over tw like 10, 15, 20,000 units still left over. And we really noticed that that was a major issue, which as you saw from previous groups, that's what drove them into close to bankruptcy or bankruptcy was the inability to actually be able to manage that. Uh, Turning on equity is great. Really? Questions is next? <laughs> <laughs> All right, questions, I didn't realize. I thought, I thought there was one more. Come on. What? I, I didn't realize that was the next one. Right, Go okay. for it. <laughs> Um, <laughs> well, at the end, do you mean for the final? Uh, really? How much cash do we make? Like my mic stop. What? We're presenting. Come on. Oh, okay, so uh, we were gonna uh, give it in dividends. Uh, we actually gave out uh, three hundred in dividends, uh, th three dollars in dividends. We weren't sure about. We, we weren't sure how much cash we actually had at the end. So. Yeah, I thought we had a lot. I thought we had a lot less. Our last team up is Champion Bikes, and the team consists of sorry, Champion Wheels. Sorry, uh, and the team. It's, it's been a long day, so. Um, And the team is Mohammed Isahak, Cesar Lazo, Erica Clemens, and Kelly Sharch. Very wiggly. Good evening, guys. Uh, we're Champion Wheels. My name is Kelly Shark. I'm Erica Clemens. I'm Cesar Lazo. I'm Mohamed Isahak. And we're going to be speaking to you today about our simulation game that we played. Um, our mission statement is, as a bicycle company, Champion Wheels provides high-quality bicycles that cater for different groups of cyclists. We aim to exceed our customers' expectations through our dedication and continuously train our employees. Our ultimate goal is to remain a sustainable company um, that last bit at the end of a sustainable company is uh, pretty important to this group. Um, when the double rollover did occur, we ended up um, having the highest share price by far. Um, so you could tell that when there was an error in the system or if something unexpected did happen, our shareholders would still be happy with us. Um, our strategy was to increase the market share 
over our competitors, which we uh, succeeded at, um, generate a high profit margin, outstanding, we had ex outstanding shareholder value, and our products um, were to have exceptional specifications, which helped us throughout the um, simulation quite a bit. Um, our first decision to make whenever a rollover occurred was to look our competitors' uh, financials, and we made our future decisions based on those. So we didn't automatically go and look at our past decisions and see how they affected us. We strictly looked at our competitors first. And I'll hand it off to Mohammed, the Director of Financials and New Product Development. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, so this is part of our strategy of why we were successful in, uh, in, in our world. Uh, let's start with assets uh, improvement. Uh, Champion Wheels actually accumulated assets over the years, and we continually uh, invest more in our assets over the first uh, four years, as you could see. And then we, we maintain a certain capacity because we do not want to produce extra bikes because we know that a lot of uh, the other groups had problems with inventory and we did not want to incur that problem at all because there was a high uh, expense to having inventory warehousing. So we try not to have as much inventory leftovers. Uh, so over the years, we were able to accumulate a, a decent amount of um, assets. Uh, you'll see we topped out at $25 million. But what does the asset do for us? We really want to make that the best use of the assets. So it should generate more sales for us. And uh, you'll see it actually did generate more sales for us. Uh, this is evident by the total net income uh, actually spiking up uh, throughout the years, especially um, after the second rollover. We had the largest uh, net income. This is because we were in all the markets. We capitalized on first mover's advantage in this area. Uh, second, we'll look at current ratio. Uh, starting out, everyone started out at the same uh, ratio, uh, about seven. We actually decreased that ratio significantly. Uh, this is not necessarily a bad thing because we were actually able to use our assets very efficiently by uh, purchasing more assets and henceforth uh, the net income also increased. Uh, let's look at our financial leverage for a quick second. Uh, we started out pretty good. We took a big, deep uh, uh, dive uh, in the second year, uh, third year. Uh, actually, that's the fourth year. We, we incurred some debt early on. We made an, an error. Instead of uh, repaying the debt, we actually purchased the debt. I know the banks would actually like that. <laughs> But uh, overall, we came back and we, we stayed steady for two years and then we, the leverage went up again uh, in terms of debt. But uh, we had a very low current ratio, so as far as the, our financial leverage was, we were not really concerned about this being that our current ratio was low. Uh, overall, so what happens now? Our shareholders are looking at return on equity. Uh, I mean, it's not the most uh, uh, attractive uh, single ratio to look at because we know this is actually fueled by leverage, but we actually increased our ROE significantly over the, uh, the period of six years. Uh, but like I said, e even though ROE is fueled by uh, debt, our debt was actually strictly short term and we had a good, uh, a good uh, current ratio, so we had no issues in paying this back. Uh, as a result, we, as Kelly uh, mentioned, we focused on the, our capacity very much. Uh, we do not want to incur extra cost and have an additional inventory sitting. So as a result, we were, we, I think we, are, we gained this, this, this chart was actually similar in every rollover where we had over 90% of productivity and uh, zero idle time. Uh, and the end result was that our share price increased uh, Every year from the very start, we actually lost share price in one year. I think that was the, sec the third rollover where we overspent on uh, certain expenses instead of concentrating on what we had on hand. Uh, to tell us more about the future, we'll, we'll ha pass you on to our marketing director, Erica. Hello. So the future for Champion Wills, at this point, we're going to continue to focus on our customers' needs. Um, we want to make sure that they're continuously buying our products, so we need to make sure that we're adjusting to whatever specifications they need. Um, we also are going to concentrate on managing an effective plan. We want to make sure that our plant has very little idle time. We want to make sure that we train our associates um, to make sure that they are providing a, the best amount of time for their service 
and to make sure that they're educated on how to create our particular products. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we, we penetrate a very profitable market. So even though we're in all five markets, we adjusted our particular bikes to ensure that we were continuously progressing in those markets and not losing our market share by much. Um, and then we also want to make sure that we maintain our relationships with our distributors, make sure that we're in as available at as many stores as possible, and then also to make sure that we expand our facilities when needed. So that is our future. Thank you. Are there any questions? Any questions? Okay, so <laughs> depending on what year was offered, I know there was a company that was selling at a penny market share before um, the infusion of income. Um, we would have bought them out. To be honest, we needed more plants for to make our product. So instead of us creating that additional space, we would have just bought them, trained them on our particular specifications, and used them as our um, suppliers. Yes, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, go, sure. go ahead. <laughs> Uh, yes. Um, once once the reports were filed, uh, we'll be trying to be a little technical with the SEC, the 10K. We quickly ran to those and uh, we analyzed everybody's uh, uh, what they were doing in the market. Uh, we were actually focusing uh, mainly on those who were selling similar numbers in units as we did, or even more than us. And why why was that the reason? And once we were able to find out what the reason was, we were able to adjust our strategy for the next year. Uh, there were a couple of different uh, numbers given. There were PR awareness, um, PR effort awareness, quality distribution. Uh, we focused uh, merely on those. Uh, price was at some point was an issue, yes, but we were not really too focused on the price, even though we dropped prices a bit in the end. Also, analyzing the specs, you could see if a different uh, competitor just recently invested in a new market if their specs were aligned correctly. Thank you for your question. Go ahead. Um, well, we, there was one company prior to, to that year that we looked at and we saw that they were dropping their price and uh, they sold significant amount of units. But in terms of the, the profit margin on it, we know it was smaller than we wanted it to be. But in terms of capitalizing on that market share, we figured that we need to do that because we look at the report and we look at which particular bike had uh, sensitivity to price. And that's pretty much why we went that way. But that's a good question. Thank you. Yes, Jessica. No, 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 over there. Okay, I'm sorry. Sorry. Over there first. Okay, I'm going to throw my mistake up there. I <laughs> created more debt in the beginning by mistake. I thought I was, per I thought I was uh, paying back debt, and I actually increased our debt by a million in the beginning. So once I made that mistake, it was, okay, let me fix it in the following year to make sure that we didn't lose our market share at that point. Is there another question? Yes, um, actually that was a concern, but at, at points when you're thinking that, okay, I have lost sales, should I increase my capacity the next year to, cap to uh, capture the money left on the table? Uh, that, that, that could have been a strategy, strategy as well, but we're anticipating someone else had the same result. We're not too sure what they have. I mean, the reports only show us what we sold and what they sold. So we, we can't anticipate, okay, we're gonna have that same, uh, same result again next year. So, I mean, our concern was not to have extra capacity of, Closing inventory. 
Go ahead, Jessica. Okay, there was a, the scenario um, forecast information uh, in the drop-down box. It tells you exactly which, which particular area is uh, sensitive to PR, if it's high and it's low, and below that report is also um, a report that shows you where you should spend your money, where it's more effective in terms of, uh, ad, ad, in terms of uh, TV, internet, or magazines. So if you were to follow those number, uh, those and you were able to read or write, I guess that, that, that would have uh, contributed to it. Yes. yes. Yeah, we try, we try to uh, follow that because they give us market information and we try to follow exactly what they give us and uh, th that, that was pretty much it. <laughs> Thank you. All of our presenters came up with their PowerPoints in less than 45 minutes, so you've got to give them a big hand because I think they did a phenomenal job presenting. And all of their presentations were so well done that I think you'd hire any one of those teams. Um, very quickly, we, our mentors spent all day with us, and several people took a lot of their time to be with us today and make this event a huge success. I particularly want to thank a lot of people who took time off to be with us on our inaugural showcase symposium. We hope to do this every semester, and we hope this is going to keep growing in terms of attention and importance and the interest that the School of Management students have. Uh, I'm going to, on behalf of the mentors, Brett Johnson, who was one of the mentors who currently works with Morgan Stanley, is going to say a few words about the experience mentoring a team and being with us today. Brett. Thank you, Dr. Shanti, for having me this evening. I really do appreciate it. And thank you to the School of Management. Um, this is quite an honor for me to come back to my university and just help out, right? Uh, to the students that are currently here, I cannot stress how important it is when you do graduate to come back, right? I was at an event last night at Columbia, and it was full of alumni. And they kept saying how we're a family, right? And in order to continue to grow as a business school, in order to open up doors for each other, we need to come back. So when you're done your schooling here, like I said, it's very important to come back, give back, because you would not be here if it wasn't for somebody ahead of you. You cannot go to where you want to go unless someone's going to help pull you up. Uh, and when I was playing this game, I was actually terrible at it. I didn't do too well. Um, but what I did learn, and I hope those who didn't fare out so well and those who played the game wonderfully did learn was to be successful or reach that intangible word of success, you need to have a plan. You need to have a strategy early and implement it. Follow it to a T. And when it doesn't work out the way that you had hoped, sometimes you have to go back to the drawing board and adjust. So again, I would like to thank Dr. Shanti, I'm sorry. Thank you, Dr. Shanti and the School of Management for having me here. And uh, I, I just cannot stress how important it is to come back. Don't leave. We need to continue to grow our school. It's only going to help you in the future and help those behind you. Thank you.
If you want to get coffee and dessert, please get your coffee and dessert now. And we're going to give away the awards. All seven teams are going to get awards for the fact that they participated. And we have cash awards for all seven teams. So I'm going to uh, call on, in a minute, if uh, Ray Cassetta, the chair of our SOM advisory board, would come and help give out the awards. Just uh, in about five minutes, if anybody want more coffee, more dessert, we just need to get set up with the checks because we're going to be giving out the checks, so we have to get the checks written out and have them ready. So They're not real, but they will be. You can cash them pretty soon. <laughs> it is, you have your Christmas spending money, all the teams. So I'd like to call on um, Ray Cassetta to come up to give out the certificates and the cash awards. Placed in seventh position for a cash prize for the group for, of $225, please come up, Mia's around. That's Anjali Harris, Yvette Varga, and Myra Mangle. Please give them a big hand. As the saying goes, success is not final, failure is not fatal. We're always here to live and learn. In sixth place, Spin Wheel. The team members for Spin Wheel are Jessica De Silva, Alison Roberts, and Helen Llewellyn for a cash prize of $225 for the team. Before you go, all the participants, you have uh, a little gift for you, so please pick it up at the registration desk. And the mentors, we have sweatshirts for you, so please pick them up at the registration desk too. Thank you very much. In fifth place is MACA Inc. And the team consists of Andrew Shatri. Cindy Eng, Matthew McCartan, and Armando Paz. The cash prize is $400 for the team for placing fifth. Please pose for the photograph. <laughs>
In fourth position, the mentors particularly asked me to give a special mention for the presentation of this team is Real Wheels, Inc. They said you made a very good presentation. All of you did great presentations, but a special mention for Real Wheels. Um, Real Wheels gets a cash prize of $500 for the team. The team members are Eugene, Listwan, Marco, Fran Edmondson, and Kahetan. Kahetan's left to go to class. <laughs> Thank you. I think we have to give all of them a big hand at the end of it all. In third position, Century Cycles, and you get a cash award of $600 for the team. The team members are Justin, Greg, and Lawrence. Smile. You've done it, so smile now. Thank you. In second position is Cyclocross. You get a cash prize of $795 for the team. The team consists of Harry, Alex, and Mike Donahue. Congratulations. And the winners for this evening are Champion Wheels. You have a cash prize of $1,200 for the team of four. So please come up, Muhammad, Kelly, Erica, and Caesar. Give them a big hand. Thank you all, congratulations. At this, at this point, I'd like to also give a big hand to the staff of the School of Management. I'd like to particularly thank Virginia Dare, Devaney Hinton, Mike Sweeney, Elaine Frazier, and Billy McDermott. Thank you very much, and particularly Ray Cassetta for being with us this evening and making this all possible. Thank you very much. We hope to do it again next semester, and have a good evening, everybody.